Welcome to Sunday morning. I'm Pastor Brian here at the Sweet Home Evangelical Church. Thanks for joining today. Uh, here we are. It is, it's still November, but it is also the first Sunday in Advent. And uh, so this is the Sunday of hope. And uh, this is what we need in this world. We need hope. Uh, uh, we are doing uh, online church uh, this Sunday. Well, online only. We do online church every Sunday, but just online today just because of the governor and the freeze going on right now. And next Sunday we will uh, resume in-person church, and it's going to be awesome. And uh, so I don't have that all figured out right now exactly how that's going to work, but it will happen next Sunday. So uh, stay tuned, and, and I'll have updates during the week for you. But in the middle of all this, we have hope. It's not that we just need hope. We have hope, we, and our hope is in Christ. The first Sunday of Advent, the Bible reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, and, it, and this is a very relevant passage for us. And it says, Isaiah chapter uh, 9, verse 2, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Feel like we live in a land of deep darkness? Yeah, yeah, we kind of do. Uh, and a light will shine. And then it goes down to uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, A child is born to us, a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That is good news for us, isn't it? Into this world of darkness, God sends Jesus, who is light. And that is, that, is, that is worth everything right there, isn't it? Dear Lord, we thank you that into a dark world, you bring light. You are the one who uh, started it all, where it says, um, it, it, clear back in Genesis, that you are the creator of light. In the book of John, it says that Jesus is the light. And, and in Isaiah, it prophesies that Jesus would come and would bring light to a dark world. And this year, we live in a dark world. But Lord, we turn to you. We pray that you would bring light and hope and life for us. Lord, I pray that you'd open up your word for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. And uh, we are, uh, we're starting in on Advent season. Uh, I'm, I'm not doing classic uh, Christmas messages. I, I think it's been years since I've done classic Christmas messages. Uh, well, actually, last year I pretty much did. We were in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. But uh, this year is a little bit different. Plus, it's a COVID Christmas, so I don't know if there's any rules anymore in 2020. And, and, and I don't know, one thing that people are turning to uh, at Christmas time is their Christmas movies, their favorite Christmas movies. And we all have our list of favorite Christmas movies, don't we? I mean, It's a Wonderful Life, top of the list there, right? There's other Christmas movies that people like, like Christmas Vacation and Elf and Rocky IV, of course, and uh, Christmas Story. And... Uh, and then, of course, uh, Die Hard, right? There's a lot of, this is a controversial topic here. I'm starting big controversy. And uh, it's a big controversial topic if Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not. Now, just stick with me here, okay? Don't, don't be mad at me. I'm going to get slightly ridiculous, but I do have a point. So stick with me here for a moment because in, in the movie Die Hard, uh, John McClane is the hero. He is a, a New York cop. He comes to Los Angeles at Christmas time to suffer and sacrifice in order to save the people who are held hostage by the evil Hans Gruber and his bad guys. Jesus came at Christmas, but Jesus didn't come just to be a cute baby. Uh, behind me here, they got, they got kind of the manger scene. We got Mary and Joseph and, and the manger and the baby and everything. Jesus didn't come just to be a cute baby at Christmas. He came to fight the powers 
of evil and to rescue all of humanity. Jesus wasn't a meek and mild wimp. He was the perfect man. And Jesus was a little bit like John McClain. He is the hero who came to do battle to rescue all of humanity from sin and from Satan. And we get this strange picture of Jesus, and, and for some reason, you know, there's this popular picture of Jesus as some kind of uh, long-haired hippie who wears sandals and a dress and was pushed around. He turned the other cheek, never offended anyone, but that's not the real Jesus, is it? Jesus was more like John McClain than we care to admit. Jesus is the hero who came to do battle, to sacrifice, to survive, in order to rescue those taken captive by evil. In our world, we need a hero, right? I mean, you know, we need more than just that, that song from the 80s uh, where they, the chorus is like, we, we need a hero or I need a hero or something like that. Uh, we need a hero, don't we? Uh, we, this is a tough year. We need a hero. The popular stories of our day, they have a hero. There is somebody who is fighting evil, they're saving someone, and they're doing it in a heroic way. This is every James Bond movie, every John Wayne movie. This is Greek mythology, and this is John McClane and Die Hard. And this year during a COVID Christmas, I think we're looking for heroes now more than ever. The Bible is full of heroes of the faith. Hebrews chapter 11 has a whole list of heroes of the faith. And Hebrews 11 even admits, hey, this isn't the exhaustive list. There's many, many other heroes, many others who are heroes of the faith. Yet these Bible heroes, they don't really do the Hollywood heroic deed. They, they are at best the sidekick because... Uh, you know, they're like Barney Fife or Chewbacca or Robin. They're the sidekick. The real hero of the Bible is God. God is the one who fights evil. God is the one who rescues people and rescues us. Psalm 50 verse 15 says, Call on me when you are in trouble and I will rescue you. That sounds pretty awesome. That sounds like Batman saying, Hey, just light up the bat signal when you need me. God is the real hero. And today I want to look at the heroic act of our amazing God, one of the amazing heroic deeds that he has done. We're going to he, we're going to look at a rescue operation bigger than anything that SEAL Team 6 ever thought about. Uh, we're going to be clear back in the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, we got uh, Genesis there, the first book of the Bible, and we got this story of Abraham. And God says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. You're going to have children, grandchildren, and descendants and all of this. Abraham's grandson, uh, Jacob, has 12 sons. And, um, and these 12 sons turn into the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, there is a famine in the land. And Jacob's son, Joseph, is a high government official in Egypt. And Joseph says, hey, you better move everybody down here. We got a famine going on. It's going to last several more years. You should come down here. And so Jacob and the whole family, all of the 12 sons, are there in Egypt. And, and this ends the book of Genesis. The book of Exodus opens 400 years later, 400 years later. We got the book of Exodus, uh, and it starts off with um, everything has changed. Everything has fallen apart. Uh, Joseph is long forgotten, and the people are miserable. It says at the end of uh, Exodus chapter 2, it says, but the Israelites... Uh, they are now in slavery, and it says the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. All right. In response to all of this, God knows it's time to act. 
Uh, in Exodus chapter 3, there's the story of how Moses is told, hey, it's time to get into action. Forty years earlier, Moses had this grand idea. He says, hey, my people are slaves. I need to free them from slavery. That did not work out well. He tried to stand up for injustice uh, 40 years earlier and ended up killing one guy and then ran off and left. But God comes to Moses and we have the whole story of the burning bush and God speaks to Moses and God says, Moses, I need you to go to Egypt. I am sending you. And Moses is like, I tried that 40 years ago and it was a disaster. And God says, don't worry about it. I'm sending you. And so Moses goes back to Egypt. He gets his brother Aaron to be his emotional support brother. And Aaron goes with him to go to Pharaoh. And Moses, you know, they tell Pharaoh, hey, let my people go. And there's songs about that, right? And he makes announcements to Pharaoh. And that did not go over well. It went about as badly as Moses' first attempt to free his people. Actually worse because Pharaoh didn't want to let all of his slaves go, and he made life even worse for them. Now, uh, the people that Moses came to free, they're all mad at him, and everything's falling apart. Moses is wondering, what have I gotten into here? And then we get to Exodus chapter 6, where we're going to be today. Exodus chapter 6, verse 1 says, Then the Lord told Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. When he feels the force of my strong hand, very heroic, when he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave the land. Things are falling apart for Moses because Moses is not the hero, is he? God is the hero. God is the hero that, that we need. God's the hero of the Bible. Our world is looking for heroes and occasionally we, we fall for a hero like Moses, yet Moses is just the sidekick. Uh, this world is looking for heroes. The world, I, I mean, they look for heroes like, like uh, they look to professional athletes as heroes, which is bizarre, really. I got a pastor friend of mine. He is the biggest LeBron James fan you will ever meet. I... Well, it's just, it's, it's bordering on, you know, kind of, he may need some professional help at this point. He is a huge LeBron James fan. And every time LeBron James changes teams, he changes teams. And now he cheers for that team and claims he's always been a fan of that team. And, you know, I mean, LeBron James, he's a good basketball player and all, but I mean, my self-worth and my well-being in life really does not depend on who plays professional basketball these days, does it? Uh, people look to entertainers to be heroes for some reason, too. It is a little strange that people who make a living in front of a camera saying words written by someone else all of the sudden are treated like they're some great fountain of wisdom just because they talk good. Our world is so starved for heroes, they even look to politicians to be heroes. And I, I don't think that's a great idea either because you look at these politicians and it's just, uh, it's getting worse and worse, isn't it? The world is shopping for a hero. And, and they keep falling for all kinds of fake heroes. And at best, falling for a sidekick. Yet, we know that God is the hero. He's the hero in, here in Exodus. He's the hero we need. He's the hero, and he's about to do something that heroes do. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 5, he says, he says to Moses, You can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel who are now slaves in Egypt. I am aware of my covenant with them. God knows what's going on. God knows. He has heard the cries of the people who need a hero. He hears our cries when we need a hero. Um, he hears my cry when I need a hero, when I need help and hope. He hears our cries. 
Do you need a hero right now? God hears your cry. It says in Psalm 50, verse 15, call on me when you're in trouble and I will rescue you. That's God talking there. God says, call on me. <coughs> we have this worldwide pandemic. This world needs a hero. We have a nation that is so dysfunctional and politics has just ruined everything. We need a hero. <coughs> We're all struggling, trying to get through this difficult world. Each, every single one of us needs a hero to rescue us. And what does God say about this? Now we get up to Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. Finally up to the text here. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people. I will be your God, and you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. This is a heroic passage here. And in this passage, we see a few things that God does. Uh, number one, uh, and, and now I'm finally up to the outline, okay? Number one, God will free you from your oppression. God will free you from your oppression. God says there in verse, verse six, he talks about how their oppression, they are oppressed, aren't they? They're all slaves. We have different ideas of what oppression is. I mean, oh, nobody likes their governor because the governors make rules and say, well, you should do this and you shouldn't do that and you, sh you can only do this or that or whatever. And, um, you know, there, there may be oppressive rules during a pandemic, but that's, that's not really oppression. <laughs> I mean, you know, the police are not rounding up people and putting them in concentration camps like World War II or anything, yet these days are oppressive, aren't they? There is a pandemic going on. It's a bit overwhelming, all these new rules and regulations to keep up with. I am, I am just, I get, oh, it's, it's just, it's a lot to figure out for me as a pastor to figure out what are the new rules because they keep changing every, every now and then for churches and what can we do? What are the rules? Oh, once I got it figured out, oh good, let's change the rules. Great. And, and it gets frustrating. It gets oppressive just trying to get through life these days. There is, a, the, you know, the new frustrating thing in life is to park your car in the parking lot and then you walk to the store and then you get up to the door and then you have to turn around and go back to your car because you forgot your mask in the car and you gotta go get that, put that on so you can go in the store just to get a gallon of milk. Uh, we've all got COVID fatigue going on. Um, you know, our, we haven't been able to go to Canada to see my wife's family in a long time. There have been some difficult things going on there, and it would be nice to be around family, and we can't do that. It is oppressive. But the good news is that God is our hero. He came to free us from oppression. It says in Psalm 99, the Lord is a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. We still have to go through the difficult times and the difficulties of life, but God is our shelter. He is our refuge. He is where we find hope. Number two, he is going to rescue us from slavery. God is going to rescue from slavery because that's what heroes do. They come to the rescue. Whether it's Batman or Superman or Mission Impossible, the hero comes to the rescue. And this is what God has done for us. Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, it says, I am the Lord, I will free you from your oppression, and I will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Jacob got his name changed to Israel. 
And this is why they are called the children of Israel. They're more like grandchildren and descendants of Israel, but they're the children of Israel. And they're in Egypt in literal slavery. We're not in slavery, okay? But we do need to be rescued. In the New Testament, this this story of deliverance from Egypt, it is used to illustrate what God has done for those who place their faith in him. God rescues us from our own personal Egypt, from a land of slavery to sin. In Romans, it talks a lot about slavery to sin and how God has rescued us and freed us from that slavery. We live in a world that is fallen. <clears throat> it is not perfect here. Sin entered the world, and the Bible says all of us have sinned too. All of us have sinned. Sin has entered this world, and if you are a, you know, you got a few uh, years in your life uh, here, and uh, after a few decades, you, you can see this world happening in real time and see our world getting, falling further and further away from God, getting more and more sinful. Is there any hope? Of course there is. God comes through in a heroic way to rescue us. It says in Galatians 1.4, Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned, in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. God is the one who provides rescue for each of us. God will rescue you. You need to say, yes, I want to be rescued, but God is there to rescue you. And number three, God will redeem you. God wants to redeem you. The Bible talks a lot about being redeemed. There's, the, there's old hymns. Uh, the old hymn, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. God says here in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. Redemption. Redemption. Um, we see this in a very small way uh, with pop cans and water bottles and things like that, right? Here in Oregon, that, oh, a couple years ago, they bumped up the deposit on pop cans. Now it's 10 cents. And so um, they, they keep that 10 cents somewhere. I don't know where that, that dime goes, but there is that 10 cents. And so you drink that water bottle and then you got to take it somewhere so that you can redeem your 10 cents and get your 10 cents back. This idea of redemption means it's going back to where it should be. It's going back home. The family of Jacob, <coughs> Jacob and his 12 sons, they were free people going into Egypt. And somehow along the way, it never explains how or why, but they were put into slavery. And God is going to redeem them. This, this slavery they were in, it seemed to be not just individuals who owned slaves, but all of them, the whole people group, they were owned by the king of Egypt, by the Pharaoh. And God says, that's not right. These descendants of Abraham, they belong to me. God is the creator God. He is the one who created the earth. He owns it all. And he, you know, he created the earth and everything in it. But when sin entered the world, everything fell apart. And it's not just a general sin in the world, but our own individual sins that separate us from God. However, God is the hero. And sending his son, who we celebrate at Christmas, is all part of this heroic redemption for all of humanity. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 says, With his own blood, talking about Jesus, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. This is where you say amen, right? 
Okay, I know you're at home alone, but say amen for me, okay? This is where you need to say amen. God rescues us. He redeems us and secured our redemption forever. Just like God rescued and redeemed the people out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, he does the same for us through Jesus. Not only that, number four, God will adopt us. Not only does God give us freedom and rescue and redemption, but there is also an adoption taking place. Verse seven, I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. The hero is going to adopt the one who he rescues. This is a whole lot better than being adopted by SEAL Team 6 or something. This is all part of God's plan. God's plan is family. God, God talks about his goal of adoption in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. It says, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. He sent Jesus so that he could adopt us. At just the right time, God sent Jesus to be born. God sent Jesus not to be a cute baby or to give us an excuse to bring a tree inside the house and eat candy out of our socks. God sent Jesus to redeem us and to adopt us so we can be in his family. That's why Jesus came. The hero comes and saves the day. He comes into our lives. He rescues us and adopts us into his family. And then number five, God will give us a home. God will give us a home. The children of Israel, they're in slavery in Egypt. At the end of chapter two, they're, they're in bondage, they're in slavery. They cry out to God in chapter two. And we, you know, we see that in the end of chapter two. And, and then this is the normal state of things, isn't it? When we have problems, that's when we turn to God. I, I, I've seen this over and over again as a pastor. Uh, people, they kind of ignore God. They ignore church. They ignore reading their Bible. But then when tragedy strikes, oh, pastor, I need you. I need God. I need you to pray for me and all of this. We turn to God when there's difficulties going on. And they cried out to God, but they didn't even know what that would look like. But God has a plan, doesn't he? He's not just going to pull off a rescue operation for hundreds and thousands of people, bringing them out of oppression and slavery. He's going to adopt them into his family. He's going to provide a home for them. And this is far beyond what they had hoped for when they were crying out. They were just crying out for relief from their misery. It says in Exodus chapter 6, verse 8, I will bring you into the land. I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. It took them a while. They eventually made it to the promised land, the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're, they're buried there in Hebron, uh, there in Israel. And the, the children of Israel still live in that land. That's why they call it Israel. God had a promised land for them to go to. God has a promised land for us too. Jesus told his followers at the Last Supper in John chapter 14, hey, I'm gonna go and prepare a place for you. In Corinthians, it talks about this, this place that is um, that when you place your faith in Jesus, that you have an eternal home not built with human hands. God is the hero who can give you and will give you more than you can ask or imagine. He provides rescue. He adopts us into his family. He provides a home in heaven for us. The question is, will you be turning to him during this time of difficulty, during this year of difficulty? Will you turn to him? That's the big question. People turn to all kinds of things. I mean, the past few months, people turn to politics, look to politicians to solve all their problems. It's not going to happen. We need a hero, and that hero is God. Will you turn to him? 
And then we have the sad verse in Exodus chapter 6, verse 9. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. Are you discouraged? Are you frustrated? Are you lonely right now? I feel like most of us have some of that going on. Don't be too discouraged to hear from God. Don't be too discouraged because God is the hero that you need. Uh, there's all these fake heroes uh, in this world, uh, these alternatives and possible sidekicks, uh, but uh, God is the hero that you need. Will you cry out to him today and say, God, I need you. I'm living in this dark world. I need you. I am in slavery to sin. I need you. I need to be redeemed. He does that. Uh, when you ask him to forgive you of your sin, he will redeem you and bring you back to the way it was supposed to be before sin entered this world with Adam and Eve. God was in relationship with Adam and Eve, and he desires to bring you back to that. And you can have that when you place your faith in Jesus. And he's going to adopt you into his family, and you've got a home in heaven waiting for you. Isn't that good news? That is great news. As we head into this Advent season, God is the hero we need. Lord God, we turn to you today. Lord, we thank you that you are this heroic God. You do what heroes do. And so much more amazing than anything we could ask or imagine. You saved us, not temporarily, but eternally. And you have an eternal home in heaven waiting for us when we say yes to you. Lord, help us to be your people. Lord, we trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for joining me. Have a great week. And uh, yeah, catch us later. Uh, I got, we do videos during the week. And we'll have Sunday, uh, next Sunday coming up. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.